Welcome to Development Engineering. This course is focused on how engineering and technology can play a role in global poverty reduction. And in this first lecture, we're going to first start with an overview of global poverty challenges in the fields of global health, development engineering, and sustainable development. So let's take a look at where we are. You all recognize this place, I hope. What's cool about this image is that it's not a drawing, it's not a graphic, it's actually a series of stitched images of every spot on the earth on a cloud-free day, in the daytime, of course. So those white areas you see are the Sierras and the Rockies and the Himalayas. And this looks pretty familiar to us. So let's take another look at the planet. I'm sure many of you have seen this picture. This picture is showing power but not just electricity, also political power and economic power. This map is showing where rich people live. You can see the United States and Europe. That's the Nile that's lit up in North Africa. You can see India almost completely outlined. You can see China starting to emerge. But there are still billions of people in the world who don't have reliable energy. There's three billion people in the world, almost half the world's population that use fire on for everyday cooking needs and energy needs. And they live here. These are fires. Some of these are forest fires, but much of this light are from campfires and cooking fires. Three billion people every day use wood fuel for their daily cooking and energy needs. Two billion people in the world don't have safe sanitation and almost a billion people don't have access to clean water every day and those numbers are probably soft they're probably underestimating the actual magnitude of the lack of access to these basic necessities of water and sanitation and energy let's take another look at the planet the unfortunate thing about climate change is that the people that are the most susceptible to the extreme effects of climate change are also the ones who are least responsible for it and the least prepared for it. In Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, there's already now perpetual, persistent, extreme drought, famine, disease patterns are changing. For example, malaria is a parasite that lives in mosquitoes. It's actually killed more people in human history than any other cause. And one saving grace of it is that it couldn't live historically above about five or six thousand feet because it's too cold for the parasite and cities like Nairobi were created because people noticed that there was not malaria there they didn't know why but that's why Nairobi was founded where it was founded and uh, and only in the past couple of years is there now malaria persistently in Nairobi for the first time in history and crop patterns are changing and rainfall patterns are changing and they're hitting the countries and the people that are the least prepared and the least resilient to these extreme effects of climate change. And just in the course of my career, there's been a sort of a separation between people that might be working on the science and policy side of climate change and people that might be working on the human health and program side of poverty reduction. And now those have collided. Our work is about climate change and adaptation, and it is about poverty reduction at the same time. Okay, here's another way of looking at the planet. These maps are from worldmapper.org. This is proportional world population based on geography. So the world looks pretty familiar. We have a billion people in Africa, a billion people in India, a billion people in China, about 400 million people in the United States, a billion people in Europe combined. Looks familiar. Proportional population to land area. Here's another way of looking at the planet. This is economic growth between 1975 and 2002. Africa almost disappears. Central and South America are considerably reduced. China is huge. India is emerging. Obviously, the United States and Europe dominate the planet. And closely aligned with economic growth, we see carbon emissions. This is proportional carbon emissions or per capita carbon emissions in the year 2000. And you can see how closely it correlates just graphically between economic growth and carbon emissions. So you can see how closely intertwined the use of energy is with economic growth. The United States is the historic greatest, single greatest emitter uh, 
on a countrywide basis. Only in the past couple of years did China pass us in terms of annual emissions, but they're going to have to emit a lot more to catch up to the total emissions from the United States. And they have three times the population and a lot of people coming out of poverty every day. And you can see again that Africa, with the possible exception of South Africa, has almost no carbon emissions. There's very little energy use to speak of. And yet there are all those economic and health benefits associated with increased energy use that we have been able to benefit from. And now we see almost the inverse proportion of people living in poverty. Africa jumps out at you. The United States and Europe almost disappear. But we still see China and India. They are huge. These are two of the countries that drive economic growth, drive emissions, but they also have huge fractions of their population that are still in poverty today. So if we go back again and see proportional carbon emissions and proportion of population living in poverty, you can see where there is still the greatest need to address extreme poverty and where, again, some of these extreme effects of climate change are already being felt in the areas of the world that are the least responsible and the most susceptible. So what is global health and global development and development engineering and poverty reduction? These are all catch-all terms for the practice of engaging in addressing these issues of poverty in developing countries. And unlike some professions, there's no right answer. There's no textbook that we're going to provide in this course saying, here's how you do global poverty reduction. In fact, there's extreme debate about whether or not this field should even exist, if there should be trade instead of aid, if we, by engaging in this work professionally, if we're propping up totalitarian and autocratic states. So there's huge debate about whether or not to practice this work at all, let alone the mechanisms and means of practicing it. So, but a lot has been learned. So it's not like it's a blank slate. You don't come along and go to a village in Africa, discover poor people, think you're gonna solve it uh, with your own elbow grease. There's a lot that's been learned that we're gonna share throughout this course. So what is poverty? The United Nations defines the international poverty line as a dollar and 90 cents per person per day in purchasing power parity, PPP. So this is, we're already getting into the jargon of international development. PPP, purchasing power parity, is a way of equalizing goods and services. It takes into account relative costs of goods and services for basic needs and also things like exchange rates and inflation. But it sets this international threshold of a dollar ninety equivalent per person per day. And this is people that fall below this line aren't even able to meet their basic needs. Obviously, there's a huge gray area there of people that make more than $1.90 per day that are still pretty poor. Uh, but it puts in economic terms a definition of poverty. Of course, it's widely recognized that economics aren't the only dimension of poverty. There's also social inequality. There are this political equity and rights and human rights and gender rights and educational opportunities and uh, social status that all play a role in relative poverty in a country. And in fact, the Human Development Index tries to consider some of these other dimensions. It ranks every country in the world on the Human Development Index and looks at health, looks at knowledge, and looks at standard of living. And the top countries in the world were number five, we're not number one, and the bottom countries of the world all of them are in Africa. And in fact, Africa hosts the most number of what are called the least developed countries. So it's in the area of the world that has the most extreme poverty today where we sit now in 2018. So this is the share of the world population who are living in absolute poverty. If you look over on the far right uh, projections for 2015, that's actually a little old at this point, but it gives us a rough idea of where we are. Roughly a billion people in the world still live in extreme poverty. And again, those numbers are a little soft. If you look at people that are living on $2 or $3 a day, it starts to become 2 billion people or more that don't really have those basic needs met in a reliable way. And as I mentioned, this also captures many of the people that don't have access to safe water, safe sanitation, or reliable energy. So why do we care about income? Well, one reason is we know income correlates to life expectancy in many cases. This is an animation of every country on Earth over the past 200 years. It's from a 
website called gapminder.org, and I'm going to post a few other resources uh, for this tool. But what you see here is on the x-axis, you see a log of income, so it's a log scale, and on the y-axis, you see life expectancy on a regular linear scale. And the dots are at each country in the world, and the size of the dot is the population. So I've highlighted three countries that you can pay close attention to as this restarts. Rwanda, we're going to talk about Rwanda a few times throughout this course because our team has a lot of experience there. China, obviously highly relevant in a global sense and obviously more recently as it emerges as a global power. And the United States, a place that we're familiar with. And you can see, if you look at those three countries, but then also the rest of the countries that you see behind it, you can see that as income increases over the past 200 years, reliably life expectancy increases. Do you see those two big drops that you saw? Let's see when it restarts here again. You're going to see the world wars and the Spanish influenza. And in Rwanda, you'll see the genocide of 1994 happen. So here we are in 1830. Most countries in the world are poor and have a low life expectancy. The United States is creeping along. China is, is stuck in the back. Most of those uh, countries that are in yellow are Europe. And here you see, there you go, there's World War I. And you're going to start to see World War II happen. There you go, there's World War II. And after World War II, most countries in the world really take off. And we get to where we are today, where the United States and Europe and rapidly approaching China are increasing in wealth and life expectancy. So we know that health is a very important measure of poverty. And in fact, much of the work that we do and many other practitioners in this field focuses on how you can improve health. And some of this work is done, as you would expect, by clinicians and doctors and nurses and worrying about hospitals and healthcare systems and insurance and medical devices and medical supplies. But actually, much of this work is done by engineers and by epidemiologists and by program professionals who focus on intervening in health hazards on a community level. So looking at things like water supplies and air quality and education on a community and a household level. And this goes back to the origin of epidemiology. Epidemiology is the study of disease and the study of how interventions can reduce disease in populations. This is a map from 1854 of a few neighborhoods in London, England. And it was drawn by a physician, a doctor, uh, John Snow, not, not the John Snow from Game of Thrones, but uh, another famous John Snow. And a lot of people were coming in to him with cholera. And back, back then, people thought that you got cholera from the miasma. So airborne, you would get it through the air, through the fog. And he started to become skeptical of this mode of transmission. And so he took out a map of the streets around him and he looked at where all the incidents were. So that's what you see here highlighted in black bars are the incidents of cholera. And then he identified that the most number of incidents were surrounding this one pump on Broad Street. So this was the earliest form of epidemiology and looking at clusters of disease and trying to use statistics to identify what a common source may be. And sure enough, he developed this theory that the cholera was being transmitted through the water supply. This is the Broad Street pump. Uh, it's still there. And you'll see it doesn't have a handle on it. That was his intervention. He went to this pump. He took off the handle and cholera disappeared from the neighborhood. So in one fell swoop, he invented epidemiology. He did a study on an intervention and he proved uh, the concept of waterborne disease, or at least he put a lot of evidence behind it and created our, helped create our modern germ theory. So this is England in 1854, and this is Kenya in 2016. We work in almost precisely the same field. 
we look at how we can sustain water services, how we can measure water quality, how we can make sure that clean water gets from the point of collection all the way to the point of consumption. We don't take for granted that a water pump like this is necessarily good for health. We don't take for granted that putting in a water pump is necessarily sufficient to impact health. A lot of these studies are still happening. So let's further expand on the relevance of health as an important indicator and yardstick for addressing global poverty reduction. This is a map of what's called the global burden of disease and uh, generated by the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation up in Seattle. And you can access this data at healthdata.org. This is just a screenshot, but it's a highly dynamic online platform. And it lets you visualize what is causing disease burdens in developed countries or high sociodemographic index countries, SDI countries, rich countries, and low SDI countries or least developed countries or poor countries. So in the top, you see what kills people and makes people sick in the United States and Europe and other rich countries. It's heart disease and stroke and cancer. And you can see anxiety there and Alzheimer's. And you don't see these environmental issues like lower respiratory infection, LRIs. You see it's only a small fraction of health issues. Uh, you see road injuries and falls and self-harm as being the things that cause injury and death in the United States and in other developed countries. These are called dailies, disability adjusted life years. So one daily is one year of illness or sickness or injury. So that might be the same as 365 people sick for a day or 12 people sick for a month or one person sick for a year. It's an accumulation of all the illness uh, attributable to a given cause. So let's look at the lower bars down here. Heart disease is still there, cancer is still there, but the leading causes of illness in developing countries and poor countries is respiratory infection and diarrhea and HIV and neonatal issues. So these are often, some of these are healthcare issues. Many of these are societal issues and environmental hazards and things of air quality and water quality as we mentioned. Here's another way of looking at this same data. This is deaths. It's a little bit more stark. You see that in developed countries and rich countries, high sociodemographic index countries, congenital defects are a cause of death in children under five. Neonatal issues are a cause of death in children under five. And in developing countries on the lower section, it's again, lower respiratory infection associated with air quality and diarrhea and malaria. These are environmental hazards. F over 5 million children die a year from these causes. Over 15,000 children every day die from the causes that you see on the lower bars. And many of these are environmental hazards, not necessarily clinical hazards. And 99% of the children under the age of five who die are in developing countries, 99%. So child mortality reductions become an increasingly important measure of the impact of health programs. And in fact, in our studies that you're gonna learn about throughout this course, we focus on children under five as our key impact indicator. Here's a few examples of, the, of decreases in child mortality, child, children under five deaths uh, in Rwanda in light blue, in Sub-Saharan Africa generally, in dark blue, and in green in the world over the past roughly 20 years. So you see that in 1994 and 1995, Rwanda had a huge increase in death in children under five. This was the genocide. In Rwanda in 1994, nearly a million people were killed in a three month span in a country of only about 10 million people. So you see that in this data. But over the past 20 years, you see the fastest decline in child mortality recorded anywhere in the world, uh, and that's in Rwanda. So what is global development? We've established what is poverty. We've established how health is an important dimension of poverty. What is global development? It's the practice of trying to address these issues. It's the 
professions that are engaged in trying to improve the quality of life and health and education and opportunities and trade for people in developing countries. And there's a lot of different versions of global development. So foreign aid is a term that's often used to talk about donor countries, often Western or developed or global north countries. There's lots of different terms for talking about the high sociodemographic index countries and the developing or middle and low sociodemographic index countries. Some people say global north and global south, western uh, versus developing countries. Third world is an old term. In fact, third world used to just mean unaligned countries. There was uh, the United States and Europe and there was Russia and China and the third world were the unaligned countries in the Cold War. So it didn't, it didn't used to originally mean first, second, third, uh, although it kind of evolve in that way. So at any rate, foreign aid is usually big bilateral aid from countries or intergovernmental agencies like the United Nations or the World Bank putting money into developing countries. There's also nonprofit organizations that many of you may have worked with uh, that are try to do work as a bottom up. So they grassroots work with communities, work with partners. But in reality, it's pretty fuzzy. A lot of the grassroots organizations still work on national levels. Uh, Mercy Corps, for instance, based here in Portland, has a half a billion dollar a year budget and they operate in 40 or 50 countries around the world. So there's a lot of interplay between the foreign aid work and the NGO work. But in both cases, the money for the work often comes from a developing country in some form or another, maybe a donor or a national budget or an intergovernmental budget, into a program implementer or into a transfer of technology or funding that are designed to have a positive impact on people in developing countries. Now, it's not necessarily entirely benevolent. Sometimes there's strings attached. Sometimes uh, they are loans instead of grants or um, free access to trade or to funds. Uh, so all of that gets mixed into here. Politics and power get mixed in with these development efforts too. But generally, it looks like this. Money comes in from a donor. It could be your own, you donating to UNICEF or to Mercy Corps, or it could be money from the World Bank or the Gates Foundation or the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, and goes into programs that often have a technology component. Not always, many programs are not technology based, but many are. So things like water and sanitation and energy, water pumps, off-grid solar systems, cook stoves, latrines, water filters, etc., that are designed to impact people's health and livelihood. But one of the big challenges is that that actual impact, the intent over here on the left, the intent of the money is to have a positive impact, but the actual impact as measured and sustained over time, is a little bit squishy. Uh, many programs have a positive impact, but often it might be very short-lived. If there isn't support for maintenance and operation and what's called capacity building, if there is not tax revenue to support local governance, uh, half of the water and sanitation programs that are installed every year are broken in about 18 months and in many cases never get fixed. So there's real questions about the efficiency and cost effectiveness of this model. And again, this happens at all levels. This is your local Rotary Club or your Engineers Without Borders group all the way up to the World Bank. So who practices in this field? Who does global development? Development economists look at trade and look at behavioral economics and look at behavior change. Engineers look at some of those same questions and also the technology side of infrastructure. Clinicians and, and uh, other nurses and doctors will work with healthcare systems. Epidemiologists study interventions and create interventions. And entrepreneurs and business people also have an emerging role. There's more and more emphasis in the past roughly 10 years on what's called social enterprise and social entrepreneurship to create business models around providing interventions on the theory that it, it aligns profit motive, that motives become a little bit more transparent, uh, and that the programs can be sustained long term. But this is also something that is at best emergent and not a completely solved problem. So what are the models for development? As I mentioned at the beginning, there is no prescriptive, this is the way you do it and that's the way you don't do it. 
there's been a lot of debate. Historically, development models favored top-down approaches with large infrastructure investments. And often these failed because there was not the local capacity or regional or national capacity or tax bases to support these programs. So about 20, 30 years ago, the pendulum sw swung over to supporting local community-based grassroots efforts, although also with mixed results. And today, there's a little bit more of meeting in the middle. There's more emphasis on governance and statism and trying to encourage capacity and what we call service delivery, so sustaining services long term. So we're going to spend the next few slides reviewing uh, the past 60, 70 years of development theory and practice. There's four major stages of international development policy. The post-World War II stage, which built on the Marshall Plan and the rebuilding of Europe, a focus on poverty and humanization of global uh, development efforts, neoliberalism in the 80s and 90s, and then where we are today, where we look at things in terms of broad goals, like the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals, and international, bilateral, multifaceted partnerships that mix a whole bunch of different institutional types to try to achieve positive ends. So the first stage was the post-war and decolonization era. So roughly the 1940s through the 1960s, where many, many, many countries around the world were freeing themselves from colonial masters. Uh, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund was established in 1944, right at the end of World War II. The United Nations created in 1945. This was the beginning of the modern system that we all exist in today that is under threat today, but that we've all grown up inside. And the first version of global development was inspired by the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was the massive billions upon billions of dollars that went from the United States into Western Europe to rebuild Western Europe. And it truly was rebuilding. And I think that's a very key point here. There were institutions, both people institutions and physical infrastructure that existed before the Second World War and it was destroyed. So money could go in and literally rebuild these institutions. The international community tried to export that same idea to Central and South America and Southeast Asia and Africa where these institutions hadn't really existed or at best they had colonial masters and so there was a lot of, of political upheaval at the same time that money was being spent in these areas and a lot of it had strings attached. These were loans and these were uh, demanded political concessions and this is where the CIA was meddling in everybody's business and uh, it, there's a lot of bad blood and misbehavior during this era. And uh, But there was a lot of good stuff too. Peace Corps was established in 1961. Peace Corps is not a development agency. It's a means of exchanging Americans with, with people in developing countries and to learn from each other's cultures and to try to build goodwill with the United States. Uh, and so there's a big role for Western expertise and experience and funding. But in the 70s, there started to be a recognition that this really wasn't working. There's a growing liberalism uh, in the West and in the United States and anti-Vietnam era and protests. And there was a rejection of Western dominance, both within the Western countries as well as in developing countries. And there started to be a theory developed called dependency theory, where instead of aid being looked at as a benevolent tool, it was looked at as another form of neocolonialism or imperialism and imposing will on other people. And so there was a growing interest in the local context and building communities and, and capacity from a ground up. And it had the effect of bypassing the state. The, the initial uh, post-war era of development focused on state capacity for better or worse. And in the 70s and 80s, organizations bypassed the state. They said these states are corrupt, they're fragile, they're captured states, they're, they're under the influence of foreign powers, uh, corruption is endemic. We're going to skip that and go straight to the village level. One challenge with that is that skipping the state reinforces the state's lack of capacity. If you don't work with the national and regional and local governments, all you're doing is reinforcing the fact that they're not able to provide services. And this 
is where we are today to a certain extent. So in the 80s and 90s, there was a restructuring of foreign aid. And there, became, there was a tension between neoliberal approaches and progressive approaches in addressing these global issues. So arising out of this was the increased role of non-governmental organizations, NGOs and nonprofits, some of which are massive now, like World Vision and Capital Relief Services and CARE, named after the original CARE packages dropped in Western Europe. And coalitions started forming to try to address global global epidemics like HIV and AIDS and providing massive access to vaccines and things like bed nets. And other approaches started emerging, like microfinancing. Uh, for example, the Grameen Bank started in Bangladesh and started to demonstrate that small scale microfinancing, at least in some cases, could help people get out of poverty on their own. I'm oversimplifying this and we have lots of readings to go through on, on this concept. And then let's look at where we are today. From the 2000s, basically through till now, we look at these broad architectures that we try to get behind as institutions, as countries, both developed countries and developing countries or Global North and Global South, under these umbrellas that the United Nations puts together such as the Millennium Development Goals that we'll review in a moment, or the Sustainable Development Goals that are brand new, or the Paris Climate Accord, or the Accra Agreement, that try to build collective action towards global poverty reduction and have all of those institutions aligned together. So there's the Gavi Alliance for providing vaccines, or the Global Fund to fight AIDS and TB and malaria. Uh, and there's a increasing evidence, there's increasing reliance and uh, weight put behind evidence-based action. So in the past 10, 15 years, there's been a lot of emphasis on what are called randomized control trials, and we're going to review those later in the course, but basically collecting the most rigorous evidence you can to inform programs and to inform policy. Now, I'm sure we'd all want to say, okay, good, we're now in the modern era, uh, we figured out all these mistakes, these are the right answers, we're going to do RCTs, we're going to work with governments again, we're going to work in uh, multilateral institutions. Uh, doesn't really work that way. There's still a lot of limitations to these systems. Uh, there is quite a bit of debate about the appropriateness of our current approaches. So, is this working or not? Does foreign aid work? The optimists will say that in the past 15 or 20 years, 440 million vaccinations have been provided, 360 million bed nets have been provided, 6 million people have been provided with antiretroviral treatment, and a billion people have been pulled out of poverty in the past 50 years. Those are really good metrics. And uh, foreign aid experts will take credit for those gains. The pessimists will say that most of that poverty reduction has happened in China. Most of those people brought out of poverty are in China. That we've created dependence rather than independence in developing countries. That by engaging in this foreign aid practice, we are at minimum inadvertently reinforcing autocratic regimes. We are reinforcing governments that do not represent the interests of their people, but we prop them up by helping provide services and that we are not well focused on governance and, and countries owning their own destiny and that there are perverse incentives and a lack of accountability in the institutions we work for, that there is self-preservation instead of mission-based work. So we're going to have readings on this topic, but there is quite a bit of debate about even the effectiveness or appropriateness of working in this field. Okay, let's do a little bit of reality check on this issue. Foreign aid works, foreign aid doesn't work, people brought out of poverty, reinforcing autocratic regimes. Foreign aid is not the only source of money and resources going into developing countries. This is uh, a map of net ODA received per capita. So ODA, Overseas Development Aid, it's an aggregation of all of this money. And the darker blues are per capita more money into these countries. It's about $130 billion in 2014. So let's call it $150 billion per year going from the global north into the global south. 
Let's compare this against other money that's going into developing countries. You see ODA down there, roughly 120, 130 billion dollars per year in the uh, lower line. There are many other sources of money going into developing countries, including debt and equity investment and foreign direct investment. So these are companies, or organizations investing money, institutions investing money in developing countries. And very importantly, remittances. This is money that is being sent back by diaspora, by people living and working outside of developing countries and sending money back to their mom and dad and to their kids and to their family. And it's four times the amount of money as ODA. So this is important work to work in development, but it's not the main source of money that is investing in developing countries. It's not World Vision and Mercy Corps and Catholic Relief Services that are the vanguard of pulling people out of poverty, even if it is effective. There is obviously a role, or we believe there's a role for those organizations in this type of work and the work that we do, but it is a fraction of the amount of money and resource that goes into developing countries. So there's a little bit of a reality check. We can get very heated and very worked up about the rights and the wrongs and the goods and the bads of working in, in global development. It is not the dominant reason why econ economies are impacted in developing countries. So if we pivot a little bit to looking at these global goals that often drive agendas, these are the United Nations Millennium Development Goals that were effective from 2000 through to 2015. There were eight goals. Each of them had sub goals beneath them, uh, but broad things, reduce poverty and social inclusion, reduce child mortality, uh, ensure environmental sustainability. Number seven there, that sounds vague, but within it, one of the goals was cut in half by 2015, the number of people without access to clean water. That's the one that a lot of our work fits within. One of the challenges is that while these were global goals, uh, compliance was reported by each country. So each country decided on their own how they were going to measure and report and what they were going to report. And there were different incentives for different levels of reporting. Sometimes having low numbers meant you got more money. Sometimes having high numbers meant you got more money. Uh, there were a lot of pitfalls in the data collection. I'll give you one example. The United Nations claimed that we met SDG 7 for water, that in reality, we cut in half the number of people without access to clean water, it went from 1.4 billion people without access to water, clean water, to 700 million people without access to clean water. And in 2015, the Secretary General, you know, figuratively and literally patted a bunch of people on the back saying, good job world, we accomplished that goal. Half of the people that were provided access to water in those 15 years have access to a water source that isn't working right now. And probably roughly half of the people that have access to a water source that's working have access to a water source that is contaminated. So it's possible that as much as three quarters of the gain under the Millennium Development Goals for water is not real. And we're, we'll have some readings on this specific topic, but it really highlights some of the, uh, some of the counterintuitive motives and, and issues that come into play with these kind of broad goals. And we've doubled down on this as an international community. Here are the sustainable development goals. There's 17 of them instead of eight. And a, one goal is no poverty. And goal number 17 is partnerships for the goals. Uh, these are broad. They are even more ambitious. And they're supposed to take us through as an international community through to 2030. And they have all of the same limitations that the Millennium Development Goals have. There are no clear metrics for many of these around how you measure and what you're measuring uh, and what the measures of success are. And because they're so broad, it's really easy to say you're doing all of these or you're doing many of them. Um, and it may not be as strong a convener as people hope. Now, I'm not trying to be a critic. Uh, too much, you know, this is, it's easy to be a critic. It's really hard to practice. It's really hard to try to create consensus uh, and to try to motivate action. But there are clear limitations that are important to discuss and to try to improve on. Okay, we're gonna take a little bit of a pivot now to talking about how all of this theory and these goals are put into practice. And I'm gonna give just a brief introduction to what our team does uh, here at OHSU and PSU in the Suite Lab.
We work at the intersection of engineering, technology, policy, and health and business to try to address these challenges. Our team works on things like rural water points trying to address sustainability and water quality. Here's a good example of a broken water point. I mentioned that under the Millennium Development Goals, as many as three quarters of the people that were claimed to have been provided access with clean water don't have access right now. Well, this is a water point that almost certainly was reported in Rwanda as water, clean water access for an entire village. And you can see it's non-functional. Now, there are approximate reasons for this water point failure. You can see that these bolts sheared off. But really, the ultimate failures are organizational and managerial and, and questions of accountable and responsible governance and questions of, in, of incentives within the nonprofits and other organizations that put in these water points. But all of those come together into this mess where installing water points has been the motive and the uh, and the incentives have been around that rather than sustaining water services. And our team works a lot on this question. And one of the things that we did was install sensors on hundreds of these hand pumps in Rwanda a few years ago. And we looked at a few different maintenance models. We're going to come back to this in another lecture. So this is just an introduction for today. But we looked at how we could monitor water services using our sensors and then link that data to ongoing maintenance and link that maintenance to payments. So we work on the technology side, the institutional side, the services side, and the money side, how you actually make this go around and try to incentivize long-term service delivery. And our team looked at a few different mechanisms for water point maintenance. Before we started this particular program in Rwanda, pumps were broken regularly. About half of pumps were broken at any given time. And on average, when a pump broke, it was broken for more than 200 days. We looked at that baseline against what's called a circuit rider model, where there were paid technicians to go around and maintain water points, uh, but they didn't have the benefit of our sensor data. And we compared that against what we call the ambulance model or the dispatch model, where our sensor data was used actively to deploy technicians. And in this study, and it was just a study, we were able to get maintenance down from 200 days to 20 days. And we moved average functionality from about 50% to over 90%. So this is some of the research that our team does to try to support improved policy and technology adoption in this area. Here's another example. This is uh, pretty common cooking practices in Rwanda. Open campfires, this is called a Rwanda Reza stove. Uh, equally common are three stone fires. We spent the beginning of this lecture talking about uh, the global burden of disease and how respiratory disease is a leading cause of illness and death. And you can see why. So our team over the past few years, we installed over 350,000 cook stoves across Rwanda to try to address biomass reduction and air quality reduction. And we coupled that with behavior change messaging to get people to cook outdoors and to use these cook stoves exclusively. And we also had another intervention, which was a household water filter that could effectively eliminate all microbial contamination, but only if you use it regularly and you use it exclusively. This is Rwanda, a country of about 12 million people. Over in the western province there on the left, we covered half a million people with stoves and filters. And over on the right, in the eastern province, we covered a further 1.2 million people with just the cook stoves. This is a massive effort. We put about $25 million into this program, had about 2,000 community health workers working with us. We'll talk about this program in more detail in a later lecture. But we also ran an RT RCT, a randomized controlled trial, where in yellow, the sectors that are highlighted in yellow, these villages did not receive the stoves and filters for a year. And we studied the health outcomes between blue and yellow to try to establish if our program was having a positive health benefit. And we did a 30% reduction in diarrhea, a 40% reduction in respiratory distress, and this was backed up by clinical level data. And as part of this, we also measured behavior. So we put sensors inside water filters and cook stoves, and we measured people's behavior. And we used that for a bunch of purposes. We used it to compare use against health outcomes, compare it against other measures of behavior. We used it to help inform how we were changing our behavioral messaging to try to get people to use the stoves and filters exclusively and consistently. 
And we've also been linking the sensor data to payment systems. In this particular program, the private company that put this money in earns carbon credits from the continued use of the stoves and filters. And our sensor data were, was a piece of that puzzle. And we've used sensor data in other similar areas to link payments to ongoing performance. In this particular study, which was funded by USAID, we looked at the difference between surveys, what people tell us they do, against what they actually do when they know a sensor's there, against what they do when they don't know a sensor's there, when it's hidden. And you can see big discrepancies. So we know that sensors can be a better measure of behavior, but we also know that sensors can cause a change in behavior. I call this the Fitbit for the water filter. We take all of this data and we're able to estimate these health outcomes. I mentioned earlier a 30% reduction in diarrhea. We also saw closer to a 46% reduction in diarrhea in one of the sub-studies. There's a whole bunch of studies that we did in this uh, program. A 73% reduction in indoor air pollution and nearly a 30% reduction in personal exposure to PM 2.5, what you're actually breathing in. And this is another program that we're working on. This is uh, out of Rwanda. Now we're in Kenya, northern Kenya where we're working across the African Great Rift Valley, which is a whole region of East Africa that is arid, that is dry, and used to suffer drought every few years. Now it's perpetual drought. It's drought every single year, thanks to climate change. And people in this region in northern Kenya get their water from these boreholes where there's these pumps drilled deep into the rock, and they're supplying water for between 1,000 and 10 or 20,000 people. And we put sensors inside these boreholes to measure runtime. And they're connected over satellite and cellular networks. And we link this data to all sorts of different institutions who are responsible for these services. So this is Ethiopia, where we're doing a similar program. As of right now, we're monitoring water for over a million people. Through 2018, we're going to be growing to about 3 million people's water supply that we're actively monitoring. And we're now linking our sensor data to remote sensing data that NASA collects with satellites. So this is a map of all the data that our sensor has been collecting over the past year, over 2017. So you see about a million people's water supply that we've been monitoring and looking at water extraction practices. And overlaid is NASA rainfall data collected by satellites. And we're working with NASA now to extrapolate based on the ground truth our sensors are collecting, see if we can correlate that to rainfall patterns and water use patterns to help predict water use behavior in the Great Rift Valley and help the entire region with water management practices. So this is one of these regional scale efforts that complement our local community focus with our sensor data. So in conclusion, this picture is the motive for many of the people that work in this field of global development. It's trying to address these extreme issues of poverty and health in developing countries. But this picture is a promise. It's not evidence of anything. You know, this picture is eight or nine years old. It's evidence that these kids had clean water the day the picture was taken. This picture is a promise. And a lot of the work that we're trying to do with our team and we're trying to communicate in this course is how we can translate these promises into actually measured performance over time. So for the rest of this course, we're gonna be looking at development theory, practice, case studies, looking at randomized control trials, all the way through to large-scale implementations. We'll be debating the merits of even practicing global poverty reduction in the first place. Uh, but if you end up the other end of that, like I did, where you say, well, we still got to try, then we'll also look at best practices and where there is still debate, but also opportunity to contribute professionally in the field of development engineering.